I'm the kind of person who likes to have all of her ducks in a row. I function best when I know what's going to happen in my life over the next few years. And this has pretty much been how my working career has gone for almost 20 years in the hotel industry. I've moved from position to position, from company to company. I've worked in different countries, including here in Kenya, in Zambia, Switzerland, and also in the USA. A number of years ago, I had a chance to work in Kuwait for about six months. And this is probably one of the shortest working stints I did. And the reason is that one fine morning, the owner of this particular hotel, the Arab owner, woke up and decided that he no longer wanted to have an African woman heading up his sales department. Now, I was a little bit puzzled when my general manager told me this, because I was thinking, but I've been black and female since I was born. I'm black and female, and I applied for the job. I sent you my photo with a CV. But I realized, no, you can't reason with a racist. In these Middle Eastern countries, you get these business owners and hotel owners who tell their general managers that they want to hire front office women who have blonde hair and blue eyes, long legs, and they can speak both Arabic and English. So anyway, I bought a ticket, packed my bags, and came back home. And thankfully, this bump in the road didn't last for too long, and within a few months, I was able to get a new work position. But they say that history repeats itself. And fast forward to the year 2015. By this time, I was working for a different company. It was a high-end safari company. And we were dealing with a kind of clientele who would very easily pay $800 or $1,000 per day per person to go and stay in the Masai Mara or some other very exotic location in Kenya. I was a marketing manager. It was a job I really enjoyed. I was working with a very nice bunch of people. And it was a tough time in the hotel industry. There had been several ter terrorist incidences that had given Kenya the reputation of being an unsafe destination. So we had a lot of work trying to convince people to come and stay in lodges in Kenya. One afternoon, I was busy working, and I get called into my boss's office for an unexpected meeting. And within about 15 minutes, this woman proceeded to rearrange my life and basically tell me that I no longer had a job with this company. Now, I won't get into the details of why they were restructuring, but let's just say that I was completely shocked, taken aback. Losing my job yet again was not part of my plans for the year. Granted that nobody plans to get themselves fired. But I remember I walked out of her office and I went to my desk to start clearing out. And, you know, when you get fired from a job, it's not like how you see it in the movies where there's always conveniently this empty carton box sitting somewhere that you can <laughs> pick up, pack your things in dignified silence, say goodbye to a few people and walk out. The reality is I could only pack and take only what I could stick into my handbag and carry under one arm. I handed back the laptop, I gave back the business cards, and I walked out without talking to anybody, basically because I was, I was speechless. I didn't even know what to make of what had just happened. I walked out of the building, and I remember it was a very beautiful afternoon. So I didn't go home. I decided to go for a late lunch, and I went to a nice restaurant. I ordered a steak lunch, a glass of wine. After that, I had a nice dessert. But I wasn't really focusing on my meal. My mind was on what had just happened less than one hour ago and how my whole life had just been turned upside down. I just kept replaying that conversation, that 15 minutes with my former boss. She said, I said, she said, I said. Should I have said something different? Did I not see this coming? And at some point, I think I remember thinking to myself, maybe I've imagined this. And maybe I'll go home, and I'll sleep, and I'll wake up, and find it's all been a bad dream, and I'll just go to work tomorrow, as usual. I think that's a stage that psychologists call denial, and something terrible <laughs> has happened. So I went home, and I slept like a baby, and I woke up the next day, and that's when reality hit me. I'm out of a job. And now I suddenly got into this stage of I got so angry, so, so angry. I'd been very peaceful the day before, but this day was totally different. There was anger, there was bitterness. I kept thinking back to that afternoon and replaying the conversation. I was asking myself, you know, why me? Why not so-and-so? 
You know, I work so hard. I'm in the office early before hours. I stay until late. I'm there on the weekends. And then I kept replaying this conversation. And that was all I could think about that day and the next day and the next day. And it went on for days. I mean, I started looking for a job almost right away. I updated my CV and started sending it out, going on to websites. I called up a few people to say that, you know, I'm back in the market for a job. But it was almost as though I was job hunting on an autopilot mode, like a robot, because my whole mind and focus was on this thing that has happened, replaying what has happened, anger, the pain, the just feeling like I can't believe this is happening to me. I remember the end of the month came, and I'm in this mode where not much is happening. And of course, bills have to be paid, rent is due, there's no longer salary to support this, which then added on to my stress. And it was a very tough time again to be looking for a job. Nobody was hiring at the time. In fact, people were laying off, companies were laying off people, downsizing, so it was not a time to be looking for a management position. And this went on now, weeks turned into months. I'm looking for a job, nothing is coming out. I'm getting more and more frustrated. I wake up in the morning and I'm just mentally stressed out. I keep thinking back to this afternoon and replaying the conversation. And every time I would remember and remember my former boss, I would come up with these phrases. And they all started with an F word. <laughs> and at some point I said, you know, if I continue like this, I'm going to end up in hospital or even worse. Something has to change. And so eventually what I did is I trained myself to each time I remember what has happened and thought about this former boss, I would think of another F word, and that word was forgiveness. I had to teach myself to forgive what has happened and this person who I believed had wronged me because I had to move on. Now, forgiveness, in my definition, is letting go of something that has happened, no matter how terrible or unjust or unfair. It's accepting that something has happened, and it can't be reversed, it can't be changed, you can't erase it. The only option is to move forward. And it's not as though I called her up or I sent her an email and I said, I forgive you. It's just that every single time I remembered and I thought of her and I thought of this terrible thing in my life, I would forgive in my mind. And because the human mind is incapable of forgetting, I had to do it over and over and over again. 70 times 7 times is what one wise man once said. But what I found was that with time, it became easier to forgive. With time, I was thinking less about the past and focusing more on the future which is what I call the point I began to reinvent myself and to think, okay, what next? And you know, when you're in this place of unemployment, you know, I find myself thinking a lot. I guess because I had a lot of time to myself, so I could think. And one of the things I used to think about is, who am I? Where do I derive my sense of identity and value and self-worth? I mean, now that I no longer have the business card to give out, I don't have the title, I don't have affiliation to this and that company, have I lost value or become irrelevant? And I thought about it, I said, no, I, I can't be, because I'm still here, I wake up every morning, life is continuing. And I came to the conclusion that whatever value I have is intrinsic. It's inside of me, and it can't be taken away. And for me, my intrinsic value is my experience, my knowledge, academic qualifications. It's also intangible things like being able to form relationships with people, interacting, networks that I formed, my self-belief and my confidence. All of this forms a package of intrinsic value which I take with me to the office and I bring it back home. When I move from place to place, company to company, country to country, my value stays with me unless I choose to let go of it. And so in a nutshell, that's how I was able to reinvent myself and go into a different line of work. I'm now a consultant trainer, so I work with different companies and organizations. And I'm also an independent writer with different publications, local and international. I write on topics of arts, culture, travel, tourism, 
conservation and different other things. And when I look back, five years ago, I could never have imagined that I would leave the hotel industry, which I really enjoyed, and then move into a totally different line of work and also find enjoyment in that. Now, this journey of reinventing and transformation has not been easy. Anybody who is self-employed or has started their own business will tell you that it's not for the faint of heart. You know, it's a very lonely life. The income is up and down all over the place. You have years like this one, which has been terrible all around. And you just have to find it within you to keep moving on. Uh, you have to remember that I came from a place where I always worked with companies which had structures and systems and procedures in place to now this place where I have to learn to do everything on my own, no support. You find the days that you're wondering, you know, why hasn't anybody called me? I used to wonder, actually, the first few days, you know, why did none of my colleagues that I previously worked with give me a call, find out where I was? I don't know why I expected that they would, but I did wonder, did they not wonder what happened to me when I walked out without saying a word, didn't come back? But I've come to realize that there is a difference between friends and acquaintances. Acquaintances have no obligations towards you, which is fine. Family has been wonderful, very supportive, although I get the occasional relative who looks at me and says, so what are you doing? <laughs> and I say to them, well, in the back of my mind, I say, you know, you asked me that question six months ago, and last year I gave you the same answer. What aspect of me are you not understanding? And the thing is, when you make such a drastic transformation of your life, people don't know what to do with you. I found that people don't know how to interact or conversations seem to die out after one or two minutes. There were times where I thought, well, I've been promised a coffee date, but it doesn't seem to be materializing. Sometimes I'd meet people in a supermarket and they'd wave at me from afar and zip around the corner. <laughs> and you almost go through what is called the temporary loss of social esteem, when people don't know where to place you. Are you successful or not successful? Crazy or courageous? <laughs> and I came to the point where I said, you know what? I really don't care anymore what people think about me. I mean, if, <laughs> if I'm not doing something illegal or immoral, why should I worry what you're thinking about me, about what I'm doing, the way I'm dressed, my hair, what car I drive, where I live, you know, those are your issues to deal with. Mine is I need to get on with the business of life and I need to focus on the people who matter in my life. And this is a choice I made. In fact, my life has become a continuous series of choices. I make choices every day. I make the choice to wake up in the morning on time. I choose to be happy. I choose to look for opportunities. I choose to maintain a social life and get out there and interact and be with people and face uncomfortable questions and strange looks. And I also choose to be thankful. Now, I know thankfulness and the attitude of gratitude are overused phrases, but I got a new take on them about a year ago when I went to some event and there were different speakers. And one person said that every day he makes a list of 20 things that he is grateful for. And something about that statement stuck with me, and I decided to incorporate that into my life. And so now every day when I wake up in the morning and before I even get out of bed, I make a mental note of 20 things that I'm thankful for. I'm thankful for friends, I'm thankful for family, I'm thankful for work, I'm thankful I have a roof over my head, there's food on the table, I'm in good health, I move around in relative safety and come home in one piece. I'm even thankful for challenges, because I've come to realize there's no such thing as a life without challenges, it's just how you deal with them. And that whatever challenges I'm going through, I'm guaranteed somebody else is going through a lot worse. And I learned that lesson in a new way not too long ago when I went to visit a friend in hospital. He's in ICU, so rather sick. And he just lies in bed all day, doesn't talk much, is mostly sleeping, doesn't eat too much either, and he's breathing with the aid of an oxygen ventilator. And when I left the hospital, right away I had something new to be thankful for. I'm thankful that I can walk, I can talk, I can enjoy my food, I can breathe 
on my own. So there you have it. Yes, you can, if you choose to. You can rise up from a situation of failure. Yes, you can forgive. Yes, you can reinvent yourself. And yes, you can find 20 things to be thankful for every day. Thank you.